wicked one. Next. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the translated world there is the Greek aeon, which means age. All right. So the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Next verse. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that are fair, and them which do iniquity. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. They shall be willing the gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then he says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Remarkable, remarkable. If you followed the reading of the scriptures, then you have understood the parable of the tares. And the wheat, because Jesus Himself explained it. You can't you, you can't do it any better than the one who gave the parable. So I just read the parable to you, and I read His explanation to you. If you missed anything, go back and read for yourself. But I want to point out a couple of things. First, I told you the children of God. We have the children of God, and we have the children of the devil. And right away from there, he tells us there were wheat and tares. And the Satan sowed the tares. Number two, something striking Jesus said in verse number 30. I want you to go there. Remember, he said, the field is the word. All right. So God, he says, the son of man sowed the children of the kingdom. Son of man, that's Jesus. That means, that means he's telling you that's the church. Because it's, son of man didn't sow Israel. Son of man sowed the children of the kingdom. All right? That means they came from Jesus. So that's the church. All right. So you got the church and they're in the world. You are in the world, but not of the world. The, the field is the world. So right in the world, you also have well. The children of the wicked one. Here's what Jesus said. Let both grow together until the harvest. So Jesus is saying, I'm not going to kill those that don't believe in me. I'm not going to kill the children of the wicked one. He says, let them grow together. Queer, in the field. And that's been happening since... The day of Pentecost, when he saw the church right in the world. So the growth of the church has been going on. He says, until the harvest. He said, the harvest is the end of the age. When the Son of Man comes, so their work also has advanced. And that is what you saw. And I told you, they will collide with God's work that also had advanced. Or, or was I talking about there? The Spirit of God was telling us something from what Jesus said here. Let both grow together. I want you to know that the advancement in the house of God is not in any way behind all the technological advancement in the world, nor whatever advancement they have in the negative spiritual. I want you to know that even though they've been planning for a long time, so have God also been planning with his children and growing his church. So in 2020, when they thought that they were ready, we were also positioned correctly, appropriately. I told you there was a, a realignment, there was a, a reordering, and things were happening, just like how God was raising David, and they didn't know. They didn't know. They had no clue who was going to be the next king. But at the appropriate time, he brought David right to the 
kingship. But he had been training him with the lion and the bear. And he took out Goliath. What I'm saying to you is this. Jesus said, let both grow together until the harvest. And that growth has been going on and we're close to the harvest now. And the church has surely grown. The church is not a baby. And we can take on Manto Cabrasia. We can take on any force in the world. That's why I told you. Those who assume that somehow the church will go under because of their threats and so on, they're deceiving themselves. They're deceiving themselves. He said, let both grow together. He didn't say let the wheat uh, or let the tares alone grow. They came from the devil. And they've been watching themselves growing. But we also have been growing. We have been growing. Isn't that amazing? I didn't even know it. Remember, I talked about it. When they said they wanted to vaccinate almost the whole world. In fact, they said that they said they wanted uh, no less than 80% of the world's population vaccinated. Think about that. And they came up and said they have a plan. Seven billion plus to be vaccinated. We were going seven billion plus disciples for Jesus Christ. And we were not trying to re-echo something from them. No, we just spoke in the spirit. We just spoke in the spirit. Let me tell you what is happening, what we're doing is not ordered by man. So there is a real conflict in the realm of the spirit, but the overcomers were also predetermined. I want you to go to St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. Let's read from verse 12. The words of Jesus. Prior to these verse, Jesus was talking about things that will happen in the end of time as uh, the age came to a close. He was talking about the signs. Then he said, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So all this been happening it said before before that harvest and before that end of the age these will happen and we've seen it in the church age we've seen it in church history all the persecutions the matters and so on and so forth next verse and shall turn to you for a testimony thank god that's what happened he says settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer now here's what i want you to see for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain, say, nor resist. In other words, they can't counter what you say. They can't refute what you say. They will have no argument before what you say. Because I'll give you a mouth and a wisdom that all your adversaries, all of them, shall not be able to gain, say, nor resist. I should tell you something. In 1 John chapter 4, from verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. 
Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He was talking to us. He was talking to us. He says, you have overcome them. All of them with antichrist spirits. Doesn't matter how vicious they appear. Doesn't matter how angry at you, at us. Makes no difference. And Jesus said, marvel not if the world hates you. He says, don't even care if they hate you. So every child of God, every Christian, never be bothered if they say they'll counsel you. No, anybody that's trying to counsel you is counseling himself. You cannot be counseled. You have to understand it. Don't be moved. Have no fear of them whatsoever. They can't cancel you. They can't marginalize you. Because there's something inside you that causes you to grow. Okay, that's verse, verse 4 we read, right? Go to 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Yeah, yeah. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The word error is from the Greek plane. It means deception, fraud. Chapter 5, same book. 1 John, chapter 5. Look at verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory. That overcometh the world, even our faith. Look at it in the Amplified Translation. For whatever is born of God is victorious over the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Where else do you find things like this written? Which book in the world? And this is real. This is true. Whatever is born of God is victorious over the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. So I want to take you to another thing, the parable of the fig tree. I've dealt uh, some with this before, but I want to I want to bring up something else. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, from verse number 32. All right, now, go to ch chapter 24, verse 32. 
So Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it for leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, you, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Now, he was talking about the kingdom of God coming. He was talking about the end of the age. And um, if you read in verse number 3, can you go to verse 3, Matthew 24, verse 3? And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Again, the world there, Aeon, um, referring to the age, the end of the age. Okay, so go back to verse 32. It says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender, and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, you, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And we've talked about this before, that is referring to the generation that sees this rebirth of Israel, referred to here as the right, and... Um, uh, we did talk about how it became a nation again. But what I want you to see is actually when he tells you about, you know, that summer is nigh. And um, what, what does it mean by summer? What summer? What summer for Israel? Summer spares judgment for Israel. And the nations. That's what it spares. You know that summer is nigh. It says when you see these things. You also know that it is near. Even at the doors. You know it is near. Even at the doors. And we know that just before he comes back. There will be what? A judgment period. Which is called the great tribulation. And that tribulation period. Is, uh, is full of several judgments. You know, um, you have to understand the subject of judgment in the word of God. It's not just when God calls people and start, you know, um, talking about what they did wrong. No, there's some actions that are taken. I refer to judgment. But if you go to Amos chapter 8 from verse 1, I'm going to show you something right there. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruits. God showed Amos a basket of summer fruits. What did he say after that? Look at verse 2. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Now, that last line in the King James Version, you don't, you don't get it. What he's saying is, I will no longer overlook their errors. I will no longer overlook their sins. In other words, I'm going to take actions against them. The end is come upon them. See, he says, what did you see? A basket of summer fruit. He's saying the time of their judgment is come. The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them. And if you... You want to understand a little more about that um you can you can read from verse 14 st matthew's gospel same chapter 24 from verse number 14 see what the word says and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come you see this is the final thing this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come and i'm saying to you this gospel is going around the world like, like, like most people never thought possible. It's happening with tremendous speed and tremendous spread and tremendous penetration like nobody thought possible. 
except by the eyes of the prophetic. So it's happening. It's happening. Put it back there. Put the scripture there. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That's very important. Don't forget that verse. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Look at the next verse. And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso read it, let him understand. Look what he just done. He just told you about the preaching of the gospel to the whole world. Then suddenly he tells you about Israel back on the calendar. Israel back on the calendar. Because during the church age, Israel is suspended from the calendar as God's focus. God focuses on the whole world to pick out a people for himself to form his church, the church of Jesus Christ. And according to the prophecy of Daniel, in the uh, 70 weeks, he gets to the 69th week, and then there the church age comes in. And God deals with the church until when he returns to the calendar with Israel. For the 70th week. The church is not part. Of the 70th week. And something interesting happens. I, I showed you. Before. Before. Summer hits. The church is out. Hallelujah. I want to. I've shown this to you. In several different ways. This time I'm going to show it to you. In a, in a rare passage. Most people don't read the book. It's in the songs of Solomon. Who would, who, who would have thought that? Well, there are several prophetic things in there that have to do with Christ and the church. Several prophetic things in, in the book. We'll call it the, the canticles. All right. So you go to um, songs of Solomon, chapter number two. We read from verse number eight. See what it tells you. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. All right, that's the lady talking now, all right, representing the church in this particular prophetic word. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roar, a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Watch now. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. What's he talking about? He says, For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree put that forth her fig, her green figs. Now, green figs refer to the, the figs where they're not yet ripe. They're not yet ripe. So it's not time for harvest. Summer is harvest time. Summer is harvest time. When he puts in the sickle, and when puts in the sickle, it's for judgment. It's a sickle of judgment. So he says, the fig tree put it forth, ha, ah, green figs. This is just prior. Prior to the summer. Just prior to the harvest time. He says, the fig tree put it forth, ha, ah, green figs. And the vines of the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Let's go. He says, arise, let's go. So Jesus is talking to the church. He says, now, judgment is about to come. The summer is about to hit. Arise, my fair one. Come on, let's go. And then we're out of here.
So the church departs this world before summer hits. He says, when you see these things, know that summer is near. Know that summer is near. And you want to understand that harvest, which is a harvest of judgment, you can read Revelation chapter 14. It will teach you something. That will be the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, it says the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the, that's the, the, the great tribulation. In Jeremiah chapter 30, in verse number 7, it says, This is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be delivered, saved out of it. Jesus said, The tribulation will be such like the world has never seen before. Don't plan to be healed. Don't plan to be healed. All the terrible things that they're trying to do now, you can multiply them by the thousands. All those things that we are <coughs> issuing, a, we have issued a moratorium and put a hold on, <coughs> will be unleashed on this world. At that time, it cannot be a, a place to live. And those who go through that period to come to heaven can only do it by death. <laughs> There's no other way. According to the Bible, all those who went through the great tribulation and were found in heaven were from the place of death. They all had to die. They all had to die. We have only two groups who get to heaven without that. Number one, the 144,000 that the Bible talks about in, in Revelation chapter 14. You see them. They arrive in heaven. And then the two witnesses. Even the two witnesses will die. They will be killed according to the Bible. They will be killed, the two of them. But they go to heaven alive in the presence of it because they will come back to life they'll come back to life and the whole world will see them the world will be amazed as the two, these two prophets of god come back to life and then before everybody they will ascend and go back to heaven a great sign great sign haven't said that i want to bring you into colossians now <laughs> so colossians chapter chapter one from verse number 20 we're looking here at the reconciliation where glory is restored remember in in romans chapter six and um, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what he said. Okay? Sin, sin took away the glory. Man lost the glory. But now we see something. So the Bible tells us what happened with Jesus on our behalf. Colossians chapter 1 from verse number 20. We got to verse 19 uh, Monday. Was that Monday? Tuesday. Tuesday on Tuesday. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even just that line is, is, is huge. Having made peace. That means reconciliation through the blood of his cross. The blood of Jesus Christ that was shed. Shed. When he was on that cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Sagro digo para hangadila hagrades. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I hope I, I, I can control my excitement in the spirit about the word of God so that I can get you to follow some things, at least to express some things. Because almost every line gets me, you know, excited in my spirit. Because having made peace through the blood of his cross,
by him to reconcile all things unto himself. I want you to understand, he's not talking about just to reconcile men. He says to reconcile all things. Why? Because you see, back in the Old Testament, when they offered that blood, the blood was used for the purification of all things. to sprinkle the blood of everything, including the vessels of ministry. Everything was sanctified, purified with the blood. And now he says, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, by Jesus, to reconcile all things unto himself. God reconciled all things to himself by Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus. He reconciled all things. Do you know what that means? It means that now, the blessed name of Jesus is named upon everything. You see, all things have gone off the glory of God. There have been a stain, a curse on all things because of the sin of Adam, Adam's transgression. But now, all things have been reconciled. The elements have been reconciled. All things have been reconciled. The matters. The oil in the ground, everything, the air, all things have been reconciled. So look at it. So by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Hallelujah. Woo. Next verse. And you that were sometimes alienated, that used to be alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. He has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death. You were reconciled to God. Look at what he says. This happened through the death of Jesus. Here's the result. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You've been brought to God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Ah! Jesus took responsibility for your errors. Do you understand? He took responsibility for your sins. Stop blaming yourself. He is not blaming you. He took your blame. Do you understand? He took your blame. Banga, Gobra, Haseya. He took your blame. He took responsibility. He said, Father, I take his blame. I take her blame. Whatever they did, I take the blame. Stop blaming yourself. You know, there are people who, when they do something wrong, oh, they find it difficult to forgive themselves. Oh, ah. How could I have done this? How could I? Me, how could I? Oh, ah, how could I? No! If you do that, then you don't believe in Jesus. Stop doing it. Stop blaming yourself. Jesus took your blame. He took your blame. Look at it. It's in the book. Look at it. In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable. If he presents you unblameable, then who was to blame? He, he took your blame. Our sins, our errors, our mistakes. Oh, how could I have made such a mistake? Oh, how could I have made such a blunder? Stop my brother. Stop my sister. Jesus took your blame. And in the presence of God, you are holy. In the presence of God, you are unblameable. Hey, Kabarabasia. He is not blaming you. He is not blaming you. An 
unreprovable in his sight. He didn't say you didn't do something wrong. You did it. But he says he took the blame. He took the responsibility for your errors. This is Christianity. This is the gospel. That is what he told us to tell the whole world. He said, tell them I am not counting their sins against them. Oh. Look at it. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. In his sight. Others, it doesn't matter how people look at you. They may look at you like the worst sinner they have ever met. Oh, you are such a disappointment. Oh, you are terrible. Don't worry, you are not living for them. You are living for Jesus Christ. They will not be your judges. It's Jesus Christ that will be your judge. So listen to Jesus and not to them. Verse 23. If he continue in the faith, you see, you got to continue in this faith, grounded and settled. Hallelujah. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, we, we can read that verse from uh, the Amplified Translation. It puts a little light on that. Even now I rejoice in the midst of my sufferings on your behalf. And in my own person I am making up whatever is still lacking and remains to be completed. On our part, see, on our part of Christ's afflictions. Not Jesus' afflictions, Christ. Christ's afflictions, all right? Not Jesus' afflictions. Jesus played his role. The church has to play its role in the afflictions of Christ. So some people will be called to go through some sufferings. And Paul was shown in the book of Acts. He says, the Lord showed him what he will suffer for his name's sake. And the apostles all went through that. And you will have some degree. That's what the Bible says. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. All. If you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted to some degree. So he understood his own parts. You have your parts. You have your parts. It can be trouble made for you by your colleagues at work. It can be something between you and your neighbor. It can be between you and your spouse, you and your parents, or something. doesn't matter. It can be a government thing. It doesn't matter where the persecution comes from, where the trouble comes from. Because of your Christianity, if you live a godly life, you will be persecuted to some degree. Some will be persecuted much more than others. Right now, as we speak, there are Christians who are in prison, in some dungeon, in some place, who are made to suffer because of Christ. Some are going through terrible times somewhere in the world. So every one of us would have had something in our lives to some degree. That's what he's talking about. So I read it again to you. Even now I rejoice in the midst of my sufferings on your behalf. You see it? So it, it's not, it's about Christ. It's not personal. And in my own person, I am making up whatever is still lacking and remains to be completed on our part of Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Hallelujah. All right, go to the next verse, verse 25. Whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Blessed be God. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations. But now is made manifest to his saints. I remember when we were talking about the mystery of Christ. Oh, there was so much to share. But now it's made manifest to his saints, the mystery. What is it? What mystery is this? Look at it says, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. The riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can you believe that Christ is truly in you? 
Oh, it's not an assumption. Christ is truly in you. Can you meditate on that? This is a month of meditation. Would you give some time to meditating on Christ is in you? I'll never forget. I had an experience many years ago. This was uh, uh, 1987. A beautiful experience. I was praying. And I, you know, was with some others. We were just praying. And while we're praying, praying, I've been meditating on Christ in me for like about uh, a couple of weeks. And every day, I'll spend some half hour in the same position, just meditating on Christ is alive in me. You know, I'll, every, every day, I'll take half an hour just to meditate on Christ is in me. I was just led to do it, okay? And I was doing it. You know, there's some things you don't you don't know why you're doing them. You just you're just led. So I was led to do this. So every day, I'll get in the same position, and just stay there and meditate on Christ is in me. Christ is at work in me. Christ is alive in me. Now I'll go from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Christ is in me. My whole spirit, soul, and body. Christ is in me. Now I'll say that. Now I'll meditate, and then. I'll go into whatever else I needed to do. So after a couple of weeks that I've been doing this, we're out there praying, and then I was just speaking in tongues and praying like everybody else. Then suddenly those words came back within my spirit. And I said, Christ is in me. And I was lifted off the ground, about a foot in the air. And Lord just gently back to the ground. Lord, this network, how can you do this? And angels come back, it came right inside you. Right inside. So everywhere we go today, we are Christ in you persons. I'm a Christ in you person. You're a Christ in you person. Wherever you are, you know Christ is in you. You are not an ordinary person. Christ is in you. The spirit of Christ is right inside you. Doesn't matter where you go. Have the consciousness. Have the consciousness. You see, until you have the consciousness, you cannot act unconsciously in the kingdom. You know, you come to the point where you act unconsciously. I mean, the spirit is just doing things through you. But before that happens, there has to be the consciousness. I talk about Christ consciousness. You have to begin your life with Christ consciousness. Until you realize that you're not even having to be conscious. It's like you, you do some things without being conscious, you know, that you're a guy or a girl. You know, you just, you just do. Because your whole system has adjusted to that understanding. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in me. All right, guys, let's have the scripture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, that'll take us to uh, 28, 29. All right, next verse. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing in sharing the word of God with you, so that you can be built up and perfected in Christ. So you're no longer, you're not a weak person. You are tough for God. You're strong. And this is through the ministry of the word of God by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Something is happening to you while you're listening to me. Amen. You are being strengthened in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are not the same person that started this week. Yes. Something Amen. has happened. There's a glory in your life There's that has increased every day. Amen. And through this meditation, you find that the glory keeps increasing in your life. Amen. This is the transformation. Hallelujah. Oh, my Thank you, Lord God. Jesus. Verse 29, look at what he says. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. You see that? If Paul could understand that the working of God worked in him mightily, what about you? So the Holy Ghost is not just quiet inside you. He is working in you mightily. That's why you cannot be sick. Yes, sir. Doesn't matter what, how you've been before. It's an old story. 
Yes. You say in the name of Jesus Christ, Christ is in me. I declare the, the life of God is in me. The life of God is in me. Every fiber of my being, every bone of my body, every cell of my blood, every cell of my blood, Christ is in me. Christ is in me. I refuse to be sick. I refuse to be sick. Why would I? Why would I be sick? Ah, Christ is at work in me. Christ I got the life of God in me. I got the life of God. I got it in me. The life of God is in me. Twenty-four hours a day. Twenty-four hours a day. I got the life of God in me. Mango Christ is in me. Christ is in Blessed me. be God. Yes. Woo Hallelujah. Woo-hoo. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now they said that you were diagnosed with some trouble in your kidney mm-hmm. or in your why do you listen? You got the life of God in you. The Holy Ghost is parambulating your body. Ah. I refuse to accommodate disease. I, I refuse refi- to accommodate I'm disease. I'm saying no, no way. No, no to way. disease. No to I disease. don't accommodate disease. My body cannot accommodate diseases. This is the temple of God. Yes. Listen. What I'm sharing with you, I've been doing for decades the word of god works yes sir it works Amen. it works all right so that leads us into the next the next chapter good and um we did talk about um we were uh, colossians chapter 2 all the way to verse um 10 so we're taking 11 now all right. In whom also, because we're, we're dealing with the reconciliation. All right. I just took you through that. The reconciliation and glory restored. Now, this part of it is identification with Christ. All right. In his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. Look at the identification. That's what, that's what you have from this period, this part I'm going to take you through. In whom also he has circumcised. With the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is quite interesting. He's telling you that you have been circumcised by the circumcision of Christ. This is interesting. He's going he's gonna to take you into a, a, a greater light of it. Look at it. Next verse. Buried with him in baptism. Uh-oh. Did you just hear that? You were buried with him. In other words, when you were when you were baptized all right remember when you were baptized in water it was significant of what happened in the spirit that when he died you died because you were in him you were in him on the cross he took us through the cross in the verses that we read earlier you were in him on the cross when he died you died when he was buried you were buried that's why we we baptize people by immersion to signify that's when you believe that god raised jesus from the dead and you say yes then we dip you into the water in accordance with his burial and when we bring you out in accordance with his resurrection and we say now that you have been brought back to life in christ jesus start living a new life because baptism was the final separation of Israel from Egypt. Remember, they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud, which was a type of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, where your life becomes a new man. But then it says, and in the sea. So they were baptized into the water. In a sense, even though they were not in the water, they went to the bottom of the sea. So the Bible says they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So they went through and came up alive on the other side. 
But when their adversaries tried to do it, they found out there was water. So in the spirit, there was water. So God's people went to. In the natural, the waters stayed on either side, congealed, and they went through. In the spirit, the water was there. That's why it says they were baptized unto Moses in the sea. When the others came, they found out in the mind of God, there was water. And the water came back and buried them all. Final separation between Israel and Egypt. So when you are baptized in water, you don't go back to sin. You don't go back. This is, this is your new life in Christ. Because you came up in that water that now I'm alive in Christ Jesus with a new kind of life. I'm eligible for persecution now. <laughs> I'm eligible to be hated by all men. I'm ready now. I'm ready now. That, if you... You gotta know that's the meaning. When you, this is, I want to get baptized. I get baptized. Yeah, you want to get baptized. Yeah, you want to get baptized. Okay, don't think it's a game. So get okay, baptized. Yeah, but it means you have made up your mind that from now on, onward ever, backward never. You're never going back to the world. Never. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, so buried with him in baptism. Buried with him in baptism. Can you see that now? Wherein also he had risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who had raised him from the dead. That's what I just explained to you. You see that? This is how your faith works in baptism. All right, next verse. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, had he quickened, had he made a life together with him. I, having forgiven you all trespasses you know the, the, the term here is a little problematic little problematic um, in the English language because when we use the term forgive you know in the, in the general sense in the English to forgive is to pardon okay is to pass over an offense and not punish the individual but he is still a miserable offender you see it? Um, so, forgive or to forgive or forgiveness in the English is limited in its meaning, in its communication. In the real sense of it, it's like, uh, it's like the word knowledge that I discussed with you the other day. The different kinds of knowledge but when you read it in the english you just see knowledge and know and knew you think they're all the same see but the the words in the greek from where they were translated can tell you the type of knowledge that all the knowledge that you read of they're not the same the different types of knowledge and if you don't know you can apply what kind of knowledge is referring to? And like love, the word love. The word love um, is used in four different ways in the Bible. But in the English, you can't see that. Okay, you can't see that. You just, you just think they're, they're all the same. But they're not all the same. They're not all the same. For example, um, when you read of, when you say agape, okay, which is love, uh, you, you're referring to God.
God's kind of love, self-giving love, so on. Then you have another one, which is erotic or erotic, okay, eros. And um, there you're looking at a lustful kind of love, okay. Then, of course, you have filio, which is more like a, a friendship kind of love, brotherly love, okay. Um, that you extend to your friends. But there's another one, um, storge. Now, storge is uh, a family love, okay? It's called natural love. Did you ever read where the Bible says without natural affection? Good. There, the, the, it's the negative with which it is brought in, astorge, all right, which means without without the natural love, okay? So, it's only looking through those details from the language from where it's translated that you get to see that, oh, it's not the same kind of love. It's, oh, it's just love, love, but oh, it's not the same. So, same thing with this word forgiveness. In the English sense, did you know, did you know, uh, what Jesus brought to us, has, it's not forgiveness. In the general sense of forgiveness being pardon. So we have to now say, oh, what type of forgiveness? There is the pardon forgiveness. That is not what Jesus brought. What he brought to you is primarily the remission forgiveness. That's why the same word that's translated remission in several parts of the New Testament are also uh, translated or is also translated in several places, forgiveness. The word is aphasis. Or sometimes you find afiemi, which is forgive. Okay? But it actually has to do with to remit. But many times it's translated forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. No, it's not just oh, to pardon. Now, in this particular place that I just read to you, incidentally, it's another word that shouldn't really have been translated as um, forgiveness. It, is, it says, having forgiven you all trespasses, because the word is charizomai. Now, charizomai actually means um, being to be gracious to one. See, meaning that he was gracious to you over your transgressions. So it's not like he pardoned your transgressions. Like this suggests in the English language when you say forgiven, haven't forgiven you. So there are two things that you find that are consistent with what Jesus did. In the English, it should read that he was gracious to you where you have charisma or that he remitted your sins, not that he forgave. Because the word means to put away. It means to put away, to obliterate, to blot out, to completely separate from. 